All right, and welcome back. Take two for the Steelers Depot Q&A live stream. We'll give it a couple minutes for people to get into the chat, and I should be on this page. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to be just me for the rest of today. I think Dave and I will try next Monday. Um, just can't figure out why there were some of the delay and feedback issues. I know things sounded good on your guys' end, but Dave was getting feedback. I'm not entirely sure why that was happening. And trying to figure it out here in the moment was going to be challenging to do. And so I got to take the next couple of days to see uh, what went wrong, kind of using some new laptop stuff. And don't know why this issue was popping up, but apologize for that. So it will just be me for the next uh, little bit until 8 o'clock. We may go a little after 8 since we've started so late. So I'll let you guys have a couple seconds to get into the chat. And then we will start answering questions. Again, apologize for all the issues. I know these pop up from time to time. Um, but at least it's the off season and nothing super critical is happening. It's not like we're covering a game or anything where there's real urgency to a question that, you know, won't be relevant next week. Um, so I think Dave and I will try again this upcoming Monday as well with a live stream and uh, go from there as we watch O'Neill Cruz and his uh not Pirates debut, but Pirates debut for this season, at least. So hopefully you guys can come back um, from the first chat into this one. If you guys could maybe share and also like this, that will help maybe recognize and let people know that we started over. Uh, but we'll start things off here with Mutated Genome. Good to hear from you again. Says TJ Watt was the off-season's priority signing last year. Minko was this season's, who's next season's priority. That's a good question. Um, you know, Watt was from the 2017 group. Minka was from, what, the 2018 group. 2019 was Devin Bush, and so he, that career has not gone the way the others have. Um, so there may not be that stare-you-in-the-face name like there was with Watt and like there was just recently with Minka Fitzpatrick. So, you know, if Chase Claypool has an excellent season and a real bounce-back third year, he could be a guy. From there, I'm not really quite sure. I, maybe if a Kevin Dodson just has an excellent year that you know surprises everybody in a in a good way and just is playing like you know I think he's capable of playing potentially him. Other than that, there aren't any names that really kind of stick out um, to me. So I think there's more uncertainty there. You may not have that super big money deal that you've had the past two off seasons. Again, apologize, guys. Just me. Um, no Dave. I, I really wanted him on. I was trying to figure stuff out. I think Dave and I will try to uh, get back on the live stream next week, next Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern time, and hopefully by then all the audio gremlins have been figured out. We may do a test stream later this week to make sure that's all good to go before we uh, give another attempt on Monday. So just me here for the next little bit. Jesse Hernandez, which quarterback out of the, out of the, the the three do you see giving us the best chance at unlocking the deep ball? Obviously, blend with quantity and efficiency. Um, I, I want to get eyes on all these guys. I think Rudolph overall, you know, he doesn't have a great arm, but I thought his deep ball was pretty accurate. In terms of the other guys, I thought they're all kind of on similar planes. Um, but I want to see how they look in Pittsburgh. I mean, Trubisky hasn't played a lot of football in the last year, and Pickett's going from college to pro, so there's kind of a clean slate. You start with both of those guys, so um, I think they're all kind of in the same area. There's not one guy that has, I think, a much, much better deep ball or a much, much worse deep ball than the other. But you're always excited to talk about and look at the rookie and, and Kenny Pickett, but I think we'll go into camp and, and see what happens. Uh, Mendenhall fumble changed my mind. He did. I mean, it was a fumble. Now, I understand the line did not block well on that play, and I know that Mendenhall maybe unfairly gets more criticism than a David Johnson or a Doug Ligurski, but you got to take care of the football, and he did not, and that's your job. Realistic expectation for Alu Alu. Uh, it's from Michael Bolin. I think he should be pretty close to his old self. Maybe he's not exactly the Tyson Alu Alu of... 2020 when he was healthy before the MCL sprain midway through the year against, I guess that was what Baltimore. Um, but he should be a really steady, consistent, strong presence in the middle. And I think I get he's 35, but this dude had the fountain, had the fountain, found the fountain of youth, I should say, and was playing really well prior to getting hurt. And, you know, he'd been a really durable guy for a long time. So I think there's a reason to believe this guy is going to be back in 
back to his usual self because it's not like he was 27 when he was playing good football. He was 33 two years ago. People thought he was too old over the hill. Career was going to be done and move into a new position, playing no tackle to replace Javon Hargrave, and he was excellent. Hey, Ali Howard, good to hear from you. Appreciate you guys being here. Um, and again, apologize for all the issues. I know that pops up more than I would like it to, but that happens sometimes with technology and new computers and software systems that update and, and stuff like that. Uh, let's see, Colin Coward, hard on Steelers' new regime. He's clueless. Yeah, I think railing against Mika Fitzpatrick getting a an extension is is a pretty silly hill to die on. I think there was merit, and I talked about that in my terrible take today, that some of the commentary was fair in terms of the standard being lowered, that not having a losing season seemed to be the win, the expectation, the goal, as opposed to a Super Bowl and serious playoff contention and a deep playoff run. So I think there's merit there. I've talked about that for a long time, for a year and a half, two years now. But specifically to Minka being the source or the example of those issues, that seemed far off base. I'm with you there, Tim. Mike Adesso say Mitch has a Pro Bowl-type season and leads the team to a playoff win. What would, should the Steelers do a quarterback following season? Can't play Kenny over Mitch in year two, right? Mike, that's a good problem to have. I mean, it would depend on the circumstances. It sounds like, obviously, you're saying Trubisky's going to have a really good year, and so that may potentially be the case, where Trubisky remains the guy. But I think that's a good problem to have and a problem to deal with if and when we deal with it. I don't think those odds of, of that scenario playing out are terribly high, but I certainly welcome them if they do occur. So I really can't answer that well. I don't know exactly what would ha- happen. It would be a really interesting situation. In theory, if you think Pickett's developing well, I mean, Trubisky, I assume, would have a fair amount of trade value at that point, even though it'd be the second year of his two-year contract. So you could really potentially trade him and get maybe a third-round pick, something something substantial for him. So that would be on the table as well. But all good problems to have in my mind, Mike. Todd, is it time to wave bye to Mason? Um, you go into camp, you see what happens. Injury can change a lot. Somebody gets hurt. That may open a door. Um, so I don't think you say goodbye to him right now. I don't think you say goodbye to him until late this summer in late August. And you see what Trubisky looks like, what Pickett looks like. Cause those guys have yet to step into a stadium in a Pittsburgh Steelers uniform. And so I don't think you're really making any concrete decisions on who stays and who goes right here on June 20th. Um, maybe August 20th, but not, not today on June 20th. And so... I think, obviously, there's a reason why this team has added so many quarterbacks to the room, not just for the numbers game, but they spent a decent amount of money on Trubisky, signed him first day for agency, and, of course, spent a first-round pick, the first quarterback taken, in Kenny Pickett. So that is are clear signals. They don't have a lot of confidence in Rudolph being the short-term or certainly not the long-term guy. Um, but I, I think you just go into the summer, and, and again, you see what happens. Braun Blackwater, I'm excited to see what the offense will do this year. I'm ready for, quote, and now something completely different. Yeah, I think it'll be a different look. Canada's offense will be more akin to his own this year. Um, But we'll see. I think there's a lot of youth. There's a lot of talent. But there's going to be some growing pains along the way. It's not going to be smooth sailing and probably not perfect out of the gate. Levi Garcia, Alex Tewitt retire, sure, fine. But why do they let players off like two? It cost millions last year for grieving, but we lost Tilton and Nelson because thoughts on that side of things. Yeah, I mean, you could go after two it for the money if you wanted to. I don't think Pittsburgh will. Um, you're kind of moving forward, and yeah, I don't think you're going to go after two it for the money last year, obviously, um, given all that he was going going through, and of course was still part of the team last year. So I'm not really sure what the team was supposed to do in that situation. Two it was part of the team and really you know none of that stuff came up I think until after that was during the summer when his brother unfortunately was killed in that hit and run so by that point you had lost Hilton you had released Steven Nelson the cap crunch was real you figured too it's going to be part of your 2021 plans you didn't know everything that would happen with the knee and in the off field so I mean there's really no way to to know that Tim Chase, will Deontay Johnson overvalue himself? No, I don't think so. I think the market is valuing him. 
I mean, you guys have seen how hot this market is and talked about in a post the other day on Steelers Depot that Terry McLaurin might be getting paid soon. He'll be another guy that'll kind of set another another notch in that bar and um, kind of create that that litmus test for where Johnson should and will be paid by Pittsburgh or another team, assuming he uh, hits for agency next year and has a good season in 2022. So, I mean, I don't know what his contract demands are. Obviously, that's that's more his agent thing than than his personal thing. You know, think Johnson's not, excuse me, negotiating this deal, but the market is really setting everything for these receivers. But appreciate the super chat there, Tim, and apologize again for some of the technical issues that I've become infamous for. BSG 74 should Mason be traded released before training camp so that in three preseason games, if they have the bulk of the reps to go, the other three quarterbacks. Now, like I said before, I think you go into camp with Mason um, just in case the other guys get hurt or, or something doesn't work out or whatever happens. Now I do agree trying to juggle and balance reps for all the quarterbacks will be maybe the toughest thing Pittsburgh has to deal with this summer, at least in terms of going into this summer before injuries and other camp storylines pop up. But how do you handle all that? That That is going to be difficult. I mean, on paper, Rudolph should get fewer reps because you ha- you know more about Rudolph than you do the other three guys in that room. And obviously, Trubisky, the presumptive starter, should be getting the majority of the reps anyway, and you should really be pouring everything you have into him. And of course, you could say similar about Kenny Pickett being a first-round quarterback uh, quarterback your first round pick and hopefully your franchise's future um but still Rudolph is on paper uh, part of this job and will be given opportunity and certainly will need some reps um but I don't think you're going to trade him before camp or at the very start of camp Steel wide receiver how much blame if any does Ben hold for the offensive line playing can we see improvement just from him not being there defense is clearly could clearly crowd the line of scrimmage and not and worry of play action. Not really. If you think about, and I understand it was a different group of guys, but it was kind of a similar poor level of play, 2020 to 2021. Um, I mean, Ben's sack numbers were among the lowest in football. I think he was sacked 13 times the entire season in, in 2020. And, uh, you know, I think he went like five straight games without being sacked once. Just some ridiculous type stuff. And that's partially because of the, probably largely because of the snap to release times, but they were very similar 2020 to 2021. So if you just look at this group overall, it was new. It was inexperienced. It was kind of put together on the fly. You lose to Castro about this time last year. Um, You go into training camp. You're not really repping all those guys. You didn't know if Banner was going to be available. He ultimately was not. So it was really on just the newness of that offensive line, the youth there, uh, the inexperience, and again, all the growing pains that were associated with that. That's where I put the blame um, less so on Ben a little bit. I understand the, the mobility thing, but mobile quarterbacks can run themselves into a bunch of sacks. Lamar, I think, was sacked more than just about any quarterback last year. He didn't, didn't even play the entire year. So mobile quarterbacks, they're, they're good to have, but the double-edged sword of that is they will sometimes run themselves in the sacks because they are leaving the pocket so much. Sebastian Sanchez, do you think the Steelers will finally win a playoff game? Um, I'm not terribly optimistic this year. We'll see what happens. I don't have any final thoughts or predictions. That won't come until later this summer, but probably not the year many people are going to be saying this is the year the drought ends. I think people were saying that last year and in 2020 might be, and in fact, I think is a more difficult case to make this year. Mike Tallman is a top blank coach in this league, 5, 10, 15, 20. I don't have a ranking. He's probably in that, based on just present day stuff, 6 to 10 range. Um, probably closer to 6 than 10. But, you know, I, I'm a Mike Tomlin fan. I think he's a really good leader of men. Uh, somebody that players want to play hard for, that Tomlin will get the most out of. They, Tomlin can keep a locker room together and inspire and be able to, you know, guide a ship through stormy seas. And the old saying is any captain can, you know, captain a ship whenever things are calm, the waters are calm. But when things get choppy and rough, that's where captaincy and leadership really 
come into play. And that's when you're really tested. And football teams are always tested. There's always portions and moments and times during a season where things are choppy, even for teams that have good years and are on paper doing really well. Um, and so that's important. But let's just face facts. This team has not won a playoff game in six straight years. It's six straight years. That's the longest drought since what, 1966 to 71, you know, the lead up to the Immaculate Reception, the start of the pre-Noel era to the couple years before Noel arrived, so the Bill Austin era, and that's just not acceptable to have that kind of drought with as much talent as Pittsburgh has had on offense and especially defensively. So I think that a couple years ago, Tomlin would be top five for me, but just given the lack of playoff success and the disappointing losses and the way things have gone, uh, the way seasons have ended recently under Tomlin, not nearly as good as it is. This used to be a really strong December, January team that would always finish seasons well. And you've seen that backslide considerably since I think 2018 or, or 2019. So um, it probably objectively speaking is going to bump Tomlin down a bit. Thank you, Napoleon. If you guys could like uh, the channel, subscribe to the channel. Well, like this video, I should say, and subscribe to the channel. I would appreciate it again. I think Dave and I will try again next Monday, so you can hear from him as well. Um, so again, apologize for, for all that. We'll have a video tomorrow on TJ Watt as well, and a, a, a film room on one of his favorite moves and what makes it so effective. Paul Brown, hey Alex, thanks for all the content. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate you being here. Watching the Pirates. Don't think Cruz has not come to bat yet, right? He was not uh, one, two, or three today, was he? I don't think so, but I was kind of looking on and off. Only Heinz Ward and Antonio Brown got long term contracts from the Steelers. If you're not number one, you're not special, and you're not getting another contract in Pittsburgh. I think, well, factually, that's true, Braun. I don't think that tells the whole story. Um, they wanted to re-sign Plexigo Burris. They offered him the same deal that he took with the New York Giants. Um, but he just wanted to go to New York and thought he had a better opportunity to make plays and kind of be more of the guy and a potentially more pass-happy offense than what Pittsburgh offered. So they tried to re-sign Burris, obviously. They went to re-sign Mike Wallace before Antonio Brown. That was the young money crew. They couldn't pay them all. They took the contract off. AB ultimately took to Wallace first. He turned it down. So then they gave it to AB and he accepted that. They resigned Heinz War. They did, did bring back Juju. I get the circumstances were kind of different and weird, but I don't think Pittsburgh has this principled stance of we don't pay receivers. And of course they did resign Heinz Ward. He was a Steeler his entire career. Antonio Brown would have been a Steeler his whole career had he not forced his way out of Pittsburgh. So I don't think that point holds the water that you and some others have made the claim of. Uh, Micah Dess, so I've seen way too many Yinzos clamoring for the Steelers to sign J.C. Treader. Where the heck did this come from? They have like eight centers already. That would be the most un like signing ever. Yeah, I mean, Mason Cole's going to be the guy. That's just, you know, for better or for worse, and he'll be, if he could be just average, which is what my expectation level is for Mason Cole, then, then I can live with that. But I'm not pounding the table to have this team or see this team sign J.C. Treader. All reports from camp are George Pickens is the real deal and right out of the Cracker Jack box is better than Deontay after Deontay has three years under his belt. Has anyone said that? I don't think anyone said that in terms of he's already better than Deontay Johnson. And it is spring ball. They're in shorts. Pickens is an athletic guy. He should look good in that environment. So, I mean, he probably looks fine, looks good, but wait for the pads to come on and, and, and we'll kind of go from there. Uh, Alex, why do people want to run out and sign a running back when we haven't even gotten to camp to see what Durant and Warren bring to the table and why find a backup offensive tackle to more? I mean, Joe Hake's going to be that guy, going to be the swing man. They signed Trent Scott, so they brought in a veteran there. Uh, I mean, you can still sign a veter veteran running back, and I'm in that camp and still see what Jalen Warren, Mateo Durant can offer Pittsburgh, but I think you would like to have someone more proven, more trusted, with some game experience to kind of round out what is a Fairly young running back room overall. I guess Benny Snell is what the oldest guy in that running back room in his what fourth year going into his fourth year in the NFL. So it would be nice to have a more veteran guy that has played on Sundays uh, because aside from Harris and Snell, who's, you know, offensive play has been poor, that room has like 30 total career carries. And those are all from Anthony McFarland, who I think has 33. So I just think you want some alternative options there, especially if Najee 
where to go down. Um, so I've been in the camp of signing a veteran running back. Not that it solves everything, but it is just kind of maybe something that's missing from this team. Uh, if George Pickens explodes his rookie year, Deontay Johnson ain't getting a new deal. Well, Johnson's decision is going to be made this summer. I mean, if you don't re-sign him, you know, before the, the season starts, he's probably gone unless he has a great year and Pittsburgh decides to tag him. But they probably wouldn't do a long-term deal in, say, February. So what Pickens does this rookie year really won't have much of an impact on Johnson's future. Jesse, if they fail to come to contract negotiations with Deontay this year, would you feel comfortable with trading him for a third third round pick from a lower team like the Giants or Jags? I mean, the scenario to that would be it's right before week one starts and you don't get a deal done with Deontay and then you orchestrate a, con- a, a trade to ship him out of Pittsburgh to another team who presumably would be signing him to a long-term deal. So that that's a lot of pieces that I don't really think is realistic to occur. Um, maybe the only way he would get traded is if he had a had a good year, didn't want to re-sign because he just felt snubbed by the team. Pittsburgh tags him with a franchise tag and then trades him, sort of like what Devontae Adams. I think that's I think he was tagged this year by Green Bay. So maybe that's the only way you could see Devontae getting traded. But I think the odds of that happening are are pretty low. Plus, if you traded him for a third, I mean, you do get that pick now. It is a higher pick, but a compensatory pick might net you a third two years from now. So it's not like you're gaining a ton. You are benefiting in some sense, but also you don't get the play of Deontay Johnson in 2022. So kind of all washes out. So I don't really have a lot of interest if it's only a third round pick. And again, I don't really see that scenario of Johnson getting traded this summer as being really all that realistic. Uh, will Trubisky be better this year than Ben last year? Long ball got to be better. That's from Tim Chase. Yeah, I think in, in certain respects, Trubisky or whoever starts a quarterback will be better in terms of ability to move in the pocket, extend the play, um, boots, rollouts, fitting in the Canada's offense. As you said, the deep ball, the vertical passing attack. I think that will be better, but there are ways where it won't be as good, where Ben had complete control and autonomy of this offense and had been through all the experiences and was so clutch in the fourth quarter and rallied the troops and was such a, a good and valuable leader for this team. So I think in some ways you'll see improvement, in some ways you won't. It's hard to really just overall say, will it be better or not? It will be a mixed bag of results. Uh, Patrick saying AB wasn't the number one either. I'm not really sure what that reference is. He definitely was the number one in the Steelers offense, at least. Uh, Tim, I don't know what report you're referencing there. Uh, Levi, are you suggesting things I can put on my channel? I just saw a comment. I don't see the context to talking about off-season idiot football for dummies. But if so, I can certainly consider that. Austin, any actual stock in the comments on Canada's formations? His offense has historically been a function of formations and shifts. Seems like a BS complaint to me. Yeah, I mean, it's coming out now in June, so I kind of take all that stuff with a grain of salt. You know, the offense did not work well last year. It was like pulling teeth, so it's not a surprise to see and know there were frustrations and people being mad about that. When things aren't going good, people get upset. So to me, that's... It's worth mentioning mentioning and talking about, but I don't put much stock into it. Uh, Bob Yeager, where do you think Kendrick Green fits in 2022? I thought LeGlue played excellent. I think that's a touch strong of a word to use for John LeGlue, but really cool story, and it was nice to see him out there last year. I think Green's your backup interior swing guy, kind of the new B.J. Finney, now that Finney's, um, he was not re-signed, but then has officially retired. So your backup, you know, guard uh, guy, so left guard, right guard, and then the center. Uh, so left to get reps at right guard, but, you know, they, they may frame it as some sort of competition at left guard between uh, Kevin Dotson and, and Kendrick Green, but I see Dotson, provided he's healthy and available, should win that one pretty easily. So I think Green becomes your swing guy. If you're not a starter, you better be a versatile backup. And so that's where Green needs to be, again, kind of in that B.J. Finney type of role.
The infamous Tim, is it just me, or is Cam Sutton the best corner the Steelers have drafted in the past 10 years? I'd have to think about that, where Keenan Lewis was. He was right around a decade ago. But yeah, I mean, Sutton was one of the best, which, you know, Sutton's a, a fine player, but tells you kind of about how poorly Pittsburgh has drafted. Not that they've drafted the, I mean, I guess the, the Burns and Golson in terms of high round cornerback selections, but yeah, this team not known for their drafting of elite cor- cornerbacks. I think that's pretty well documented, as it looks like they're chasing a squirrel at PNC Park and having some trouble. Might be the most exciting part of the Pirates game, O'Neill Cruz aside. Yeah, they're really struggling. Anyway, I don't mean to give you a play-by-play of a, a squirrel or some critter. Yes, Nolan, I saw the comments about Chase Claypool saying he's a top three receiver. And, I mean, obviously he's not. We all know that. But, you know, all athletes are going to say and think and at least project that they're the best. And so I know that's easy, low-hanging fruit, and we wrote about that. And I'm sure we'll talk about that tomorrow on the podcast with Dave and I. But athletes are going to say that kind of stuff. I mean, what's he going to say? I suck. I'm average. I mean, no. So it's a, it's an athlete's mentality, and I have no problem with him saying that. Yeah, Todd, I think Claypool certainly can break out. I think the, the tools are there. Let's see if he can put it together. I think the quarterback he'll play with this year will help him in terms of throwing a better deep ball. All right, Patrick, I see what you're saying. AB wasn't number one when he signed his first deal. I, maybe not quite there yet, but it was clear he was going in that direction overall. Um, but you're right. I mean, he didn't get he didn't get big money. You know, he was re- restricted for agent. He was kind of had a lack of leverage, so I understand the point you're making, but they did eventually pay A.B. as the number one receiver in, in football and, of course, on the Steelers. So I think Pittsburgh's overall philosophy is they're going they're willing and able and are proven to pay for proven talent and retain top talent that they've drafted, and Deontay Johnson is no exception to me. And again, Burris, Pittsburgh tried to resign him. Young Money Crew, they were only going to basically sign one of those three guys. Um they even matched Manny Sanders' RFA tender from New England, and that was not big money, of course, but they did do that. So it's not like this team... To me, I'm not seeing any examples where this team thinks receiver play is expendable and they're just willing to dump those guys for, for peanuts or just let those guys walk. I, I have not seen evidence of that. Okay, Levi, yeah, maybe I can do some sort of football 101 kind of thing. Uh, wouldn't be a bad idea, so thank you for, for the uh, suggestion. Looks like O'Neill Cruz might be up to uh, the bat here. Yeah, Nolan, that was Jack Sawinski. Check out the article that is on the first page here. Wrote an article kind of uh, in honor of Jack Sawinski hitting three home runs, including a walk-off homer for the Buccos yesterday, about the four Steelers rookies with three touchdowns in one game. So you got Chase Claypool in 2020, which everyone remembers, Eric Green in 1990, Franco Harris in 72, and Jimmy Orr, receiver Jimmy Orr in 1958. As O'Neill Cruz steps into the batter's box, runners on first and second. I, again, I'm not doing play-by-play here, but hopefully he'll hit a home run. That'd be fun. 007, even if Canada has a lousy season, I doubt the organization just pulls the plug on him. I, uh, You might be right about that, but at that point, it's, it's, it's really a big year for him because there's no excuses about, well, it's been, and it's an awkward fit, and they're trying to feel stuff out. It's my first year as a NFL OC. You really got to start putting results. You don't have to be necessarily top five most potent offense in football. You understand the pieces around them are still young, and they're still trying to build this thing, but you want to see real tangible, significant improvement in the right direction. And so I think Canada seat would at least be very, very warm if things are as bad as they were a year ago. Um, but specifically, can they start drives better, start games better? Their first, first half offense last year, especially after the first month or so, was abysmal, easily the worst in football. That's the reason why they dug themselves in the big holes and you know relied on Ben to try to, to get them out of it. So you have to see, I think, situational football be a lot better in 2022. Ben V, when Claypool has the history of dumb stuff, uh, him saying dumb things will get exemplified. Um, you mean amplified? Yeah, I mean, I 
and that was kind of the thing where it was a little humorous from Claypool talking about he understood as O'Neill Cruz with maybe an error. I don't know how they're going to score that, but nice. He gets on base. Uh, where Claypool was talking about he understands the perception of things is really all that matters. You know, TikToks or comments with the media, you know, the way that people interpret it is really the only thing that matters. And he says something like, I'm a top three receiver in football. And he knows he's going to, the perception of that is is inaccurate, even though I'm fine with him saying that because he's an athlete. But the perception is is different from, from that. And that's all people are going to talk about. So you're still kind of like putting, uh, uh, kindling on the fire even though you know like it's just, it's going to create that firestorm so I, either he just doesn't care or just you know i don't know but i i think he has to be shown some maturity and grown up and you know we'll look see what happens this year i'm still excited for chase claypool and the talent's all there so i'm not not packing it in on on chase and i think that was an error by the second baseman by the way just dropped the ball trying to pitch it to, to short Pac-Man Jones talking as well about he would have loved to be a Steeler, so that's that's something. Uh, Eduardo, my main man, Alex K. Do you see Pickens taking over receiver two by the end of the season? I mean, I don't generally talk about receiver one, receiver two. I'd look more at positions and, and things like that. I mean, maybe the talent's there. I thought, you know, really good value pick. I think there could be a bit of a learning curve for him early on in the year, a little similar to Martavis Bryant being a young guy, didn't play a lot of football last year coming off the injury. I know there are exceptions. Jamar Chase was excellent after missing a whole season and stuff like that, but not everybody, unfortunately, is uh, going to be Jamar Chase. And if he is Jamar Chase, then I'm very happy to be wrong about that. So we'll see. Um, Johnson Claypool, two talented guys. As, hey, the other guy, uh, Madris, the outfielder, just had a first hit. Looked like a two RBI single. So that's that's a really cool moment there. Uh, I know Cruz getting all the attention. Um, so yeah, Pickens, talented guy. We'll see. Uh, I think certainly he'll be better at the end of the year than the start of it. I think that learning curve might trip him up a little bit early on, though. Joel Cross, I'm optimistic about Trubisky and the players on offense, not Canada. Would you keep Canada if this is a convincingly losing season? It really depends on how that looks i understand you're just saying like it's a really bad season and that's pretty easy for me or anyone to imagine um would not be married to it though for sure but it really depends on a lot of little factors and the reason for it and the overall players attitude towards canada and how things are being run even in difficult times so get what you're asking there joel but it's really hard for me to try to give an answer to in a crystal ball for seven months from now. Yeah, Nolan, I forget the stat too, but I mean, they were terrible, not just first quarter, first half, but I think first quarter specifically, they were a little decent early on in the year. They had a couple of touchdowns against, I think green Bay, maybe Denver. I know green Bay, they had one. Deontay had a 45 yard uh, touchdown kind of right side. But after that, they were just goose egg after goose egg. Levi, what makes players like Bush and Claypool or in general people with all the tools not succeed more smarts film or or will to compare it to like A.B. Brady? It's a lot of things. It's hard to put that in one box. It's kind of a case-by-case basis. It might be, it's usually I think a lot of work ethic, and I'm not necessarily saying those guys have bad work ethics. I think Bush really worked his butt off last year to get healthy and be ready for week one, coming off a really, you know, still tough ACL injury. I know it's always oh, an ACL, you'll come back, and that's kind of the thought process now, but it still takes a lot of doing and rehab and late nights, early mornings. Uh, mentally, it's a tough place to be, and especially he was doing it during the pandemic, and so I give Bush a lot of credit for all that stuff. But to your question, yeah, it's a variety of things. Uh, work ethic, um, Coaching, scheme, injuries, of course, can derail c- careers. So it's a it's a very large umbrella of reasons why players with talent and tools don't succeed. Off-field stuff, influences, addiction. I mean, you could really run the whole gamut here about just speaking generally why guys aren't succeeding. With Bush, it, injuries certainly played a role in that. Claypool, some immaturity may have played a role in that. Uh, but there's other factors as well. So it's hard to give a neat, clean answer to a very big but important question. So thank you for it, Levi. Just Emilio, man. I wonder if Alex is good with the running back room or would want someone new to the room. I'm good with a veteran. It's hard to find out who that veteran could or should be. 
there aren't a lot of great names out there. I'll I'll give you that. But you know, in theory, on paper, I would like to add not not just a veteran for the sake of a veteran, but just more talent to their running running back room behind Harris. I mean, Durant and Warren are interesting guys, but I would like to have another more veteran type of option. Uh, Mike Adesso, J- uh, Jace Sternberger, he was fairly highly rated coming out of the draft. Can he make the team in same vein as Anthony Miller, both getting a full offseason in camp with a team? Jace could be tight end three. Uh, I mean, he's got to battle Kevin Rader, who's kind of proven himself well as a blocker and you know kick coverage kind of guy. Uh, Sternberger was highly touted, had one good year at, where'd he go, Texas Tech? And then, you know, just kind of a big move guy that never developed, had some off-field stuff, I think, as well in Green Bay. I think he got suspended for, I forget what the reason was, for like two games and then got caught whenever he was eligible to return. So, you know, we'll see how he looks. You know, new start in Pittsburgh. You know, as Tallman says, I don't care how you got here, just that you're here. So he'll battle Raider, which is not an insurmountable guy to leap, but Raider is going to be the inside looking out. And, heck, they may only keep two, two tight ends if they want to have Connor Hayward and Derek Watt on the roster, which is to me, certainly possible. Levi Wallace over Justin Lane. Not sure what that's in reference to, Joel, but no, uh, Wallace is going to start or have a significant role and be part of uh, nickel packages, and Lane's going to be a reserve player and a gunner. So Wallace over Justin Lane. Uh, Would have liked somebody like Philip Lindsay as the backup running back. He signed with the Colts, who was clearly okay. Being behind a workhorse running back, you're right. I I mean, I don't know what Jonathan Taylor's snap count percentage was at last year, but it was lower than Najee Harris because I'm 95% sure Harris led the league in snap count last year as Cruz sliding into home plate, and he'll be in. I, I was at the game Friday. I was really hoping that they would have called him up and they call him up on a random Monday instead. So... I mean, I get that point there. Um, I don't know what contractually the, the deal was. Pittsburgh's probably not going to spend a lot of money on guys they don't expect and plan to play a whole lot. So it's difficult to kind of find that guy that fits, the veteran who wants to come in for not a lot of money and even less playing time. Um, but on paper and in theory, I would like to have a better backup running back. Braun, why is everyone tripping there? Because it's not it's not about if Najee Harris is healthy. If he's healthy, it's not an issue. It's what if he's not healthy. And even if he's only out for a week or misses the second half of a game or whatever the case is, then what do you do? And certainly if he's out long term, that would be a whole other issue. And at that point, it may not matter who the backup running back is. You're just in a tough spot. But like a short term kind of thing, you want some insurance there. If he goes down, like he cramped during the what, Broncos game, I think, last year and he missed the fourth quarter. You'd like to have a more defined and better runner there. Um, that's what I, that's, that's what I'm talking about, at least whenever I talk about the value of a, of a number two running back. Kowali Kolos, thank you for the uh, black and gold hearts. Yeah, sorry Dave's not here again. I think Dave and I will give this another go um, next Monday. Hopefully I can work out all the, the gremlins there. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened. I, I It's OBS. I'm trying to figure out stuff to work with Skype. Um, and I know it apparently sounded good on, on your guys' end, but Dave was having a, a delay and issue there. So uh, I'll have to research that and compare it to my old laptop that I was using to see what the settings were for that. It's always audio stuff is just the worst. Anytime I dealt with audio stuff, you know, in college, whatever, like it was always just the hardest stuff to figure out. Video stuff I can deal with, audio, different can of worms. Uh, let's see. Tim Chase, do you have a Dark Horse player you're excited about? Um, I'd have to think about that some. No one coming immediately to mind. Yeah, I'd have to think about that probably a lot more. As Oh, what a catch by... Is that Hayward out in right field? Um, a Dark Horse player I'm really excited about. I... I don't know if I'm excited about him, like like pounding the table for the guy, but Donovan Steiner is the only undrafted free agent last year to still be with the team. He's got good size, a good tackler, a little Edmonds Killebrew like from from what I've seen from him. Um, so I'm excited to hear and watch Donovan Steiner in your number two, the safety out of Florida.
Nolan, the inside linebacker, we got Mark Robinson isn't a censored like Bush is. Um, a censored? I don't know. I don't know if you mean that from like the mentality. Or Robinson is more aggressive and more willing to play downhill. But we'll see how he looks in camp. Obviously, you want to get eyes on him. The jump from the college game to the NFL game is a big one. This guy's played running back for most of his college career. One year at off-ball linebacker. Did well. Cracked the lineup and had 90-something tackles in the SEC. And he's a physical downhill kind of guy, which is attractive. But there's a big jump for him to make, especially in coverage. Does it mean anything to Jerry O to hear Flores say he's working mostly with the inside linebackers? Yeah, it's interesting because you do kind of wonder what Olsavsky's doing. To my knowledge, Carl Dunbar's still working with the edge guys. Flores primarily with the off-ball guys. Maybe they're both working there. I will keep an eye on that for training camp, though, and report back. Yeah, Nolan Robinson does hit, but can he do more than that will be the question. Javi Berg for 20. Can't wait to see what Austin and Pickens do this year. Yeah, those are my two favorite picks were the receivers. And so I'm definitely excited about that. If you guys have any more questions, please let me know. I'm willing to go a little bit longer today because we've we had so many delays at the start. But if we're out of questions, then you probably don't want to hear me just ramble. Again, we'll have a new video tomorrow on TJ Watt and the art of his rip move in two games that it literally no one could stop his rip move. Kimron Charles, what about Leal? What do you think? Somebody asked me in the first um, live stream tonight, what pick would I do over and who I would replace him with? The pick, I'll, I'll, I'll phrase it this way. The pick I'm least excited about is the Marvin Leal. I think he's a tweener. His run defense to me was a big concern. You can't play good run defense in Pittsburgh. You're not going to play. Look how bad things were last year. Pittsburgh does not want to have the same run defense issues they had a year ago. I know he's bigger. He's stronger. He's 305, but you had a bunch of weight. How much is that going to affect and impact your athleticism, which Leal relied on quite a bit? There's a lot of awkward there with the Marvin Leal. So maybe there's a role, and he could be a sub-package player, and that, that role is more realistic than it was five, seven, ten years ago. But I just wonder, is he really a great schematic fit, or are they just trying to kind of shoehorn a guy into a specific role and in, in part of this defense? So I do have some concern there about DeMarvin Leal. Anyway, Joe Hayden's back at the min- minimum. Um, no, unless there's like serious injuries in camp, I-, I think that ship has sailed. I think everyone has kind of made peace that Joe Hayden's Steelers days are done. And yeah, that's uh same comment there from Joel. Could the Steelers bring back Joe Hayden? I'm not going to say there's 0% chance. I don't like talking about absolutes like that, but it would take multiple injuries, I think, to bring Hayden back. Yes, Emilio, still only 89 on the roster. Um, I don't know what their plans are for the 90th man. It seems a little interesting that they haven't done anything with that. So maybe there is something a little more than just a 90th kind of guy. Um, you know, a first year guy that really no one's ever heard of. So maybe they are looking to add a more veteran type of dude, but that spot is still TBD. Mike Adesso, any tips for a first timer to St. Vincent's this summer? I'm so excited. Going to be at Friday night lights too. Excited for you, Mike. Yeah. So happy that camp's back at Latrobe. Um, reminder, if you're going to camp, you do need a ticket this year. This is new for St. Vincent. They started doing it last year at Heinz Field, but that feels a little bit more tickety. Um, you do have to buy tickets. They go on sale June 27th, I believe at 10 a.m. So one week from today, next Monday, um, they are free. I don't know how it's going to work because there really aren't seats at St. Vincent the way there are at Heinz Field, but you do need tickets. So be, uh, be aware of that fact. Um, other than that, if you're going on a weekend, get there early because it fills up pretty quick, especially if you want to get autographs, you better get there super early, probably like 12, 15, maybe for a 155 practice. Um, check the weather because it's not a lot of like shade and all that ever, you know, cover if it starts to rain or if it's super hot outside, but just have a good time. It's a lot of fun. 007. What did I think about the Minka deal over paid it or deserves every penny deserves every penny Minka totally worth it. Um, very happy that deal has got done and I have no reservations about the contract. 
the CUDA 70. If Tomlin does not do good this year, he has replaced every coach in the last two years. He has the players, if not after next year. Goodbye, Mike. I think Tomlin will be sticking around for quite some time. Uh, like it or not, that's what's going to happen. O'Neal Cruz. Ooh, showing off the arm. Good stretch by Chavis. And I do have an out of the park video that'll probably drop later this week as well for anyone. The three of you probably watching my out of the park series with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Joel, I will not go to any games. I don't go to games. I work from home for a lot of boring reasons, but um, I will be at camp. I will be at uh, knock on wood every camp practice this year, and there are eighteen of them, so it will be a very long and busy but fun summer. Yeah, Minka wasn't going to get $20 million. Uh, he was going to be the highest paid safety in football. I thought maybe it'd be a little bit lower than what it was, maybe in that $17.5, $18 million range, but eighteen point four, fine by me. So any more questions I will get to? Again, apologize for all the technical issues. Um, certainly plan and should have Dave back next Monday. And hopefully with all the audio stuff figured out. So that'll be my, my, my homework assignment for the next uh, next week. I see Witherspoon is cornerback one, Wallace cornerback two, and Sutton is cornerback three. You see it the same way. I don't look at it in terms of like CB1 or CB2, um, a little bit CB3, but I just look who's your left corner, who's your right corner, who's playing in base, who's playing in nickel in that configuration. I don't know exactly how it's going to go. Um, I, I really want to see how that looks. I mean, I think in, in sub package, it makes a lot of sense that Wallace will be at, that would be right corner with a spoon at left corner and Sutton in the slot. But I was really saying Sutton was going to be in the slot last year and it didn't, didn't happen much. Um, you know, in, in, in base, who are your two guys? Wallace with a spoon, but Sutton can play on the outside as well. So I really don't know how that's going to look there one bit. Uh, again, I'm excited to see how, that all all shakes out. You got Trey Norwood as well, Casey, yeah, Millette even on rundowns, early downs. That's how they used them last year as a kind of Mike Hilton guy on the first down against 12 personnel, stuff like that. So a lot of question marks in terms of the configuration of the secondary. You kind of know the names who are going to be on the team, barring injury, but who's going to play where and do what, and the hats they're going to you know, wear, to me, is much more up in the air. Uh, Mike Adesso, good stuff with Joel Corey. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, Joel is uh, just bedrock of knowledge, so that was a lot of fun to get to talk with him. Always good to have smart people on the podcast. Yeah, I don't know. The, the chill on Pickett, I'll go into camp and see what happens. I'm not making any, really any judgments, but I assume they, they watch that guy run as the number three throughout the spring, and they just kind of form the opinion based off of that, but that's too early to make those you know, conclusions. Todd, any truth to Dupree coming back? Not that I'm aware of. I don't know where you saw that. He's under contract for a long time. I don't know if Tennessee's going to have him for the length of the deal. He didn't produce too well last year coming off the ACL. Big year for him in 2022. But not that I'm aware of there, Todd. Not sure what you're referring to. Yeah, Wallace could be over Sutton in base. I don't know. I mean, we'll see. We'll see how they rotate. Um... It's certainly possible. It's it's Wallace and Witherspoon. It could be, really, I think Wallace and Sutton make more sense in base because Witherspoon's not a very good run defender. He's, he's got some one-two, but his overall tackling ability, not that great. So I think, honestly, if you're asking me, I would put probably Sutton the left corner, Wallace right corner in base, and then in sub, Witherspoon left corner, Wallace right corner, and Sutton in the slot. Uh, and maybe you do a little bit of Norwood mix and match as well, but I don't know how that would look exactly. That's where I'm at in terms of if you're asking my opinion on how I would set it up. But I don't know if that's going to be how they're going to set it up. Yeah, there's some some depth and some talent there in the secondary, Braun. So more than what they had last year and more experience with Norwood being a, a second-year guy, that's going to help out a lot. Um, I think you're right. There are more options there. So any more questions? If not, uh, I'll take one or two more. If not, then I'll log off and... Uh, post the archive of this and again i think dave and i will try to come back next monday to hopefully have all the bugs worked out which again it's my fault i apologize 
kind of, I don't know exactly what happened, but it, it's on me. And it's nice to see the Pirates winning. And hopefully they can maintain that lead. Brubaker's done well, although he just walked somebody. So final call for final questions. Let me just check one last time. All right, I think that's going to wrap things up then. Uh, Mike, no vacation probably for me this year. Didn't really know where to go. Uh, and yeah, Tim, computers are great when they work. It's, I don't know. If anyone knows about, if someone is on Twitter and wants to help me with this stuff, um, if anyone knows anything about OBS, which is open broadcast software, it's how I record videos and stream and stuff like that. Uh, but I guess more specifically, one of the plugins, it's the NDI plugin for Skype. That way Dave is able to connect and you're able to hear Dave's voice, which you did. But weirdly getting some feedback thing. There's probably some more I could have tried to play around with, with muting my own mic, um, because the audio comes through different channels, through the NDI, through him, and through my own you know, plugged-in mic on my laptop. But that was a, a weird one there. And I even have some drop frames, which is also strange. So a lot of weird today. Um yeah, don't know about that one, but hopefully we'll all have it figured out next time. So let me know, guys. Uh, if you have any thoughts or anything, anything you can do to help, if you're kind of a techie person, you can message me on Twitter. I uh, just say it was at the stream. Uh, can help you out with your problem, and we can try to figure this thing out. So appreciate you guys watching. We'll have an archive version of this here in a little bit on the channel. Again, tomorrow, a video on TJ Watt and Out of the Park a little bit later this week. So appreciate you guys watching. And we'll talk to you soon.